morning, Uplift Church. Hope you're all having a fabulous morning. I know that it's cool outside, but the good thing is, well, it is definitely warm in here. So we're thankful uh, for all that. Uh, over the, uh, the past few weeks, um, we've had the opportunity to kind of get to know, uh, to get to know each other. So I'm going to have you would. Uh, we're going to do the same thing this morning through this time of uh, revelation we've been going through. And a lot of it has been negative and sad and all this, but we get to spend a few minutes and uh, I say fellowship. And so I'm going to have you would just to stand to your feet. And we're going to go around and just tell uh, three to five people, tell them your name, tell them good morning, and we're going to take a few minutes, we're going to fellowship right now. So go around, visit with some people. If you don't know who they are, ask them their names. You can tell them uh, about your dog, your pets, some of you don't know. Hello, Mom and Dad watching online. I love you. Miss you already. <laughs> That's all right. I just got to tell mom and dad hi. Can you give me a hug? I love you, Miss Sharon. Good morning, Eliana. Hi, sis. I just got done telling mom and dad hi. This is a great. We just want to take a minute and say good morning. Maybe you've uh, not had a chance to tell uh, somebody hello, or maybe it's somebody you didn't know. And uh, we just want to take a minute. And just kind of introduce yourselves and uh, give you an opportunity. Maybe you came in uh, on two wheels and been able to share. That's all good too. So as we, uh, as we fellowship, the good thing about being able to do this is, is we get to find out who people are. Some we haven't seen in a while. Some we saw last week. And for some of you, this may be the first time that you got to see somebody. And so maybe you saw some new faces and uh, you got to, maybe it's just a time just to interact just a little bit. And so that's the whole point of that. And we're thankful for these relationships that we get to have with each other and what it does. And I know that we kind of already, uh, already symbolized this earlier in thanking, uh, thanking our veterans. But just kind of show you, uh, I just want you to see how far, how far this goes. If you or a family member, if you or a family member have served in any one of our armed forces, uh, if you or a family member has served in one of our armed forces, I want you to just take a minute and just stand. If you or a family member have served in the armed forces, you or a family member have served in the armed forces, whether it be your parents, your brother, um, t- you or a family member served in the armed forces, and you just see how many people that is. And so for all these people in the lives that they represent, we're going to show them some love right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we're so thankful for our veterans and what, and what they do for us. And one of the things that Revelation has shown me is that I'm so thankful for the relationship that we have with Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that all of our hope lies in. And I've learned throughout this series also that we need other relationships. We, we need fellowship in our lives. We need to interact with each other. And over the past two years, that was the relationships that's one of the things that's been challenged. Uh, has it not? And we didn't know we would see somebody, and we didn't know how close to get to them, whether or not we should... Wave at them, we was afraid to talk. And man, if you're at the gas station, you're pumping gas, and man, you sneeze, people look at you crazy. Um, it's just the dust. Uh, man, if you have allergies, bless your heart. Um, uh, it's just it's some of the times in which we live in. That's why I'm so thankful for Jesus. That is the one relationship that changes everything Jesus. And so I want to take just a minute. We're going through this Revelation study, and I just want to take a minute and just kind of, I say recap, but all hinges on Jesus, and this is the church. 
And Revelation starts out with uh, these seven letters to the churches. And we are living in what's known as the church age. And there's coming a time that the church will be what's called raptured out. Now, one of the questions that a few weeks ago I asked you, if you had a question about Revelation, then I wanted you to ask it. And one of the questions that I got asked was, uh, I have seen people mention other um, types of tribulation. This is referring to the rapture, whether it be pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. And so I want to take a minute to just answer that question. And so the rapture of the church, it's, it's raptured out, and this is what is referred to as pre-tribulation. And what that means is that the church will not experience any of the wrath of God. Or it's raptured out. So this is what's talked about in uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, that the church will be raptured out, that with the trump of God, he's going to rapture the church out. What it means is, is that there's going to be a whole group of people that are not saved. So you're divided into one of two groups. You're representing the church, so you either you are what's referred to as saved or not saved saved and if you're from a country church we refer to them as the lost saved or lost uh one of the two so there's going to be people that'll be left during this so this is pre-tribulation now to help you understand there are also two other views and i just want you to be familiar with these because i already said that one was mid and the other was post so what that means is that during this tri- time of tribulation for this right here there's going to be a tribulation period that's going to last seven years it's going to be divided into two parts, three and a half and three and a half. For this first part, the Antichrist is going to step right in, going to be the answer to all the world's problems. He's going to be a smooth talker. He's going to have all political power, commerce power. He is going to be unlike anything that we have ever seen. No, it is not Joe Biden or Donald Trump, but it will be somebody that has great political power. Now, during this time of tribulation, these first three and a half years, Things are going to be okay. But this mid part, one of the things we learned last week is that the Antichrist is going to turn. During this time frame, there are anybody that doesn't take the mark of the beast, which was another question that got asked was about the mark of the beast. Uh, actually, most of the questions that I, got, that I got asked were referring to the mark of the beast. And so I've kind of hit on that, but we want to nail that down today about the mark of the beast. During this time frame, there is going to be what is known as the mark. Uh, I got asked, is it, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be a tattoo? Is it going to be a piercing? Is it going to be a microchip? We don't know what that looks like, but we do know one thing. This mark of the beast is over one thing. One thing. And I wanted to make sure that you have your listeners on. This mark of the beast has everything to do with one thing, and that is worship. Nothing else. Worship. The mark of the beast shows your allegiance to the Antichrist. It is all about worship. He wants all this fame and glory for himself. It is nothing that you can take unwillingly or unknowingly. You will know you are taking this. Also, with this mark of the beast, once you take this, you have sealed your fate. This shows your allegiance to the Antichrist, there will be people that will be saved during this tribulation time. But once you take the mark, that is it. So this pre-tribulation means that the church will not experience any of these times. The mid-tribulation, people think that another view is that halfway through here, the church will be raptured out. The post-tribulation, it's meaning that here at the end of this seven years, that's when the church will be raptured out. We see support for this in the Bible about the church being raptured out in what we call pre-trib. It's right here, this pre. And that's why I believe and teach that because I believe that's what the Bible shows us. Others are viewpoints, so I wanted to kind of let you know that because you do hear that, uh, the pre-trib and the post-tribulation and what, what that means. Now, another question that I ask is, and I kind of already mentioned that, the people that's left during this time, will they have the opportunity to be saved? Yes, they will. But most of the salvations that occur through this time will be what's called as martyrs. 
I spelled Marty. Mar Martyrs. Y-R-S. Martyrs. And these are people that have died for their faith. They have not taken the mark, but when it came down to it, they chose death rather than to take the mark. There will be people saved through the tribulation. But remember, the water supply was affected. Food supply was affected. You couldn't buy and sell anything unless you took the mark. It's going to be very, very challenging. Very hard. But during this time frame of these seven, these seven years, there's going to be two witnesses. Now we made mention of them, the reason why we think that they're uh, Elijah and Moses. But there's two witnesses, and there's also 144,000. And somebody asked, are they Jews? Yes, they are Jews. And what they are going to do is they're going to have a, almost like a great awakening. A revival is going to break out. And they are going to be preaching and teaching everybody, everybody, everyone about Jesus. Now, the one thing that's different during this time is, where does Jesus live at right now? Where, where does he reside at? In our hearts. The Holy Spirit is right here. So, with the rapture of the church, guess what leaves with it? The Holy Spirit. So there's not going to be any presence of the Holy Spirit during this time. But they will have the knowledge of the Bible and they will be teaching. It will be hard, but yes, people will be able to be saved through this. Now, this kind of brings everybody up to speed of the where, where we're at. What we learned last week is that there was a part of Babylon that was destroyed. And this was the religious side. So they, I say they, will build a temple the Antichrist will. And everybody's going to flock to this. There is going to be a one world currency, one world religion. It is all going to be stationed out of Babylon. This will be somewhere in the Middle East. And also, during this time frame, there's a whole lot of other things that happen. I'm trying to give you the, uh, the small, condensed version. But the Antichrist, well, he gets jealous of this religion. And so what he does is, we saw that last week, it is destroyed. He turns on it. He turns on it. And so what we're seeing now, uh, today in Revelation chapter 18, if you have your Bibles, turn with us. And I said we're going to kind of go through this a little bit, uh, a little bit brief, uh, but I really wanted to kind of sum this up for you to help you understand. The whole point of this study in Revelation uh, is to kind of gain a better understanding. And don't get me wrong, I don't fully understand everything. But I really try to understand everything that I'm sharing with you. And so when it comes to an opinion... Uh, I, I don't share that, so I strictly with what the Bible uh, is teaching. And so in Revelation 18, we're seeing this destruction, the rest of the destruction of Babylon. The religious side was destructed last week. That's Revelation 17, and this brings us to Revelation chapter 18. I know I went through that really, really fast. Revelation chapter 18, starting with verse 1. This is John, and he says, After this, I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. He cried in a mighty voice, It has fallen, Babylon the great has fallen. She has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her sexual morality, which brings wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual morality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her excessive luxury. From her excessive luxury. There's two words in that that is repeated twice. Uh, Babylon has fallen. Babylon the Great has fallen. You see, fallen, fallen. And this tells us that there's two falls. One of the religious side and the rest is from this. It's coming to an end. But it makes a mention of all these other cities, these other countries. And they're ran, here's my little crown, by other kings. They are in trade with Babylon. And Babylon is greedy. Greedy. Everyone is looking to it, and there's not going to be a city like this. There never has been a city like this. It's going to be anything unreal that we have ever seen before. With this, it's not that there's needs coming out of here. Did you see what the, the description of that was? The, what's coming out, what it's showcasing. It's showcasing out here excessive luxury. So people, 
in other areas, these other countries under the leadership of these kings, it says that have lied with her because they've gotten wealthy. Supplying this greed, supplying this wealth, this pride. And so Babylon the Great, it's been a shining example to everybody else for excessive wealth, excessive greed. Now we need to understand this. Sometimes we can get starstruck on people too. Now how many times have you said, man, if I had their money, I'd be okay too. Or man, if I had that job, I'd be okay too. Well, with more money comes more problems. There's a rap song about that. You can listen to that if you want to. More money, more problems. Actually, it's called Mo Money, Mo Problems. <laughs> Verse 4. It says, Then I heard another voice from heaven. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Pay her back the way she also paid, and double it according to her works in the cup which she mixed. Mix a double portion for her. Verse 7, As much as she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, give her that much torment and grief, for she says in her heart, I sit a queen. I am not a widow. I will never see grief. For this reason, her plagues will come in one day, death and grief and famine. She will be burned up with fire because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. This is the words describing this city. And the city is describing herself as a queen. A queen that sits above everything. No problems, no worry, has no need for anything, is not in want, has everything they could possibly ever, ever imagine or need. But the downfall is, is that what was prophesied is that it says in one day, now, we've seen in our past and our history what one day can do. Have we not? We've seen what can happen. In one morning, we saw on 9-11, we saw a country tune into the TV and come all together and rally around that. And that attacked two buildings. Imagine a city. A city so self-consumed, so arrogant, they think they don't need anything. Oh, but don't forget, during this time frame, there's going to be these 144,000, these two witnesses, they're going to be telling everybody, hey, don't take the mark. They're going to be preaching and teaching Jesus. Because it says, there's a call out here. This is referred to as the, sep the voice of separation. There's a call out, hey, any of you that's in here, get out. Get out of that city. So yes, there's going to be people that's going to be still Christians that are still going to be following God, that's going to be inside that city, and it's a call out. Get out. And it, this is in verse 4. Come out of her, my people, so that you'll not share in her sins or receive her plagues. It's a call to get out of there. To get out of there. Because what's coming is to utter destruction. Up to this point, all of the judgments have already passed. God has not withheld anything. Not withheld anything. The last we saw was on these vile judgments that got poured out. And I know that, I know that my drawings and handwriting is not, not the best. But what I want you to see here with this city is that it is destroyed. And it is coming to an end. This description of this city describing herself. I sit as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never see grief. I mean, do you sense the pride? Do, do you sense the arrogance? I mean, it is, it is so thick. It's sickening. But in verse 9, we see a different tune. Verse 9, it says, The kings of the earth who have committed sexual morality and have lived luxuriously with her will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand afar off in fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in a single hour your judgment has come. So these kings that are sitting across the hill here, they're watching all this city burn up in destruction. Now why are they affected? Because the great city has fallen. They can't believe what they're seeing. Now it's affecting their pockets. Now they have nobody to trade with. You can keep on reading. Even the merchants of the sea, they're talking about this. They have nothing 
to barter with. There's nothing, this great city that everything hinged on. All of culture, all of society, all of currency, all of life hinged on this city of Babylon. And again, this is at the end times. Now, remind you, where's the church at during this time? Uh, we're with Jesus right now because the church has been raptured. The church has been raptured. This is all through and coming to the end of the tribulation period time. And this describes to us their extreme grief. The extreme grief. King James uses these words like lament for her. Like, lament, not lament. Lament for her. They are standing back and they are just in utter grief. Utter grief. Because their entire livelihood has now been impacted by the fall of this city. By the fall of this city. These countries right here, they've been in joint forces with Babylon. And remember, this Babylon represents not just the name of a city, but this is the satanic culture or the satanic system. That's what it represents. And it is coming to an end. It is fallen. It is fallen. The downfall about this is, is that people will still not turn their hearts towards God. There has been opportunity after opportunity, opportunity after opportunity. And the only thing that they can think of is themselves. Look at verse 11. It says, The merchants of the earth will also weep and mourn over her because no one buys their merchandise any longer. <laughs> Who are they concerned for? It's not, it's not for the lives lost. They're, it's because their pocketbooks have been affected. That's what, that's what they're... They are mourning over her. They are upset because now their sales have been impacted. But do you see the culture that's been created? Not just in Babylon, but all around. Because now everyone is so integrated in with Babylon. All what Satan has implemented that now it's affected them personally. Now it's affected them personally. And so they cry and they mourn. Now this word, this cry, this mourn it's not just feeling sorry they it's in like a panic of mourning if you could think about losing someone close to you in death that's the kind of mourning that they're doing here they are crying out not knowing how they're going to continue to survive not knowing how their business is going to overcome this Verse 15 says, The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping, and mourning. They are standing off seeing this destruction. And I just think this is absolutely crazy. Because all this time we have seen with this, over these seven years, they're proclaiming this is coming to an end. They're proclaiming, City of Babylon, don't trust her. You see these words talking about the sexual morality, uh, about lying with her. And that's because of all the satanic system that's been up. It's not talking about a sexual act. It's talking about how other countries have integrated their culture, their livelihood in with this satanic system, the city of Babylon. And now it has fallen. And they stand afar off, mourning over her. And the Bible really describes this in those two verses between verses 11 if you, read, you can read 11 through 15, it affected everybody. And through this time, we've seen people that are still proclaiming God. People that are still proclaiming that God has a plan. But instead, look at verse 18. Here's what they do. As they watched the smoke from her burning and kept crying out, Who is like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and kept crying out, weeping and mourning. Whoa, whoa, the great city where all those who have ships on the sea became rich from her wealth. For in a single hour, she was destroyed. So what was proclaimed was that this is going to happen in one day. But then it got cut up. It wasn't just one day, church. It was one hour. One hour. She gone. And in a blink of an eye, in just one moment, our state of mind can go from extremely happy and joyous who feel like the bottoms fell out. Could you imagine this being much, much worse? Three different verses that are claiming how they're mourning, how they're weeping 
And they stood back, mourning of the burning city. And you see the description of what they called it, this great city? Who was like this great city? So these other countries, they looked at this as iconic. There's no city like this. Indestructible. It makes you think of some of the the proclaiming that they had over the Titanic. This great ship. It was referred to as the unsinkable. But it sank. It sank. And this city is going to fall. It's going to fall. And they're looking back. They're like, wow, their minds are blown. Whoa, how can this happen? This great city. Because in just one hour, it's gone. One hour. Now, how great was that city? Well, let me just tell you. When God is against that city, there's nothing great about it. Verse 20. This is a kind of a change. It says, Rejoice over her, heaven, and you saints, apostles, and prophets, because God has executed your judgment on her. Then a mighty angel picked up a stone like a large millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, In this way, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down violently and never be found again. Whoa. Whoa. Never be found again. No ruins. Nothing left. That destroyed. That there's nothing left. Now see, our minds can't hardly comprehend that, but if I can bring your attention back to 9-11, when we saw these two towers come tumbling down, all was left was rubble. Just rubble. Could you imagine Nothing left. Nothing left. That's what is going to happen with this great city of Babylon that we see described here in Revelation. Now, there's something here that I want to draw your attention to because what God is doing is getting revenge for the people. And when he said, Rejoice over her heaven, you saints, apostles, and prophets, because God has executed your judgment on her. This is revenge. God is avenging the death of all those that have died in His name at their expense. See, that we saw this last week and the one before that these people that have died, these martyrs that have died in Christ, they're calling out for their blood. God, avenge us. A- avenge us. We have died in Your name. Avenge us. And so, He's saying, here it is. I'm doing this on Your behalf. God has executed Your judgment your judgment we discussed all this up to the point that god has a plan god has a plan in verse 21 we see this millstone that's thrown in we see this description this millstone that's that's thrown that this angel does and this shows us just the fulfillment of god's judgment to where there's nothing left Nothing left. Look at verse 23. It says, The light of a lamp will never shine in you again, and the voice of a groom and bride will never be heard in you again. All this will happen because your merchants were the nobility of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and the blood of prophets and saints, and all those slaughtered on earth was found in you. This is actually prophesied in Jeremiah 25, this destruction, that is going to be anything left this is it and there's one thing that brings this about that it says with this destruction and all that's going to happen is that there is nothing nothing that can be done to stop what's getting ready to take place nothing 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 at all it's coming to an end not even a lamp will be lit there will be nothing left not even a lamp lit Now that is some complete destruction. Not even a lamp lit. And the blood of these prophets and saints, all those who saw it on the earth was found in you. Not even a lamp lit. All these other nations, they've been deceived by you and ultimate judgment has come. Ultimate judgment has come. And now Babylon is completely destroyed. This great city. Now this great city, it represented all kinds of authority. Military power, all the cultural power. Political power, everything was found in Babylon, but there's one thing left that's going to take place. 
We're going to learn about that next week, and I encourage you to join and tune in with us. This will be a Revelation chapter 19 when it's finally coming to a head, and it is a very short battle. You all know this as the Battle of Armageddon. We'll learn about that next week. And then we finally get some weeks. We're talking about some good stuff in Revelation again. So I'm very thankful and looking forward to it. So what does this, what does this mean for us here? How, how does this apply to us? Well, talking about this millstone that's going to be thrown, so it's going to be thrown into the sea, there's going to be completely and utterly destroyed, nothing left. Well, we've talked about this, that God has a plan, and he's had a plan from the beginning. Randy talked about that earlier this morning. God's had a plan from the beginning. All this has already been settled. God has had a plan from the very, very beginning. But what we have been shown is a glimpse of that plan. We've been shown a glimpse of this end. And with this glimpse of this end, what we're seeing is is that God is in complete, total control. Complete control. Even when it looks like things are in chaos, God is in control. Now, can you think of a time in your life, maybe it's right now, that as you look through, it seems like it's chaos. Maybe there's times in your life that you look out and you think, ah, I just don't know, I just don't know where God's at. There's so many, there's been times in my life like, God, I just don't see you at work here. God, what, what is it that you're doing? Where are you at? Where are you at in my family? Where are you at in, in this health issue? God, where are you at in our church? God, where are you at in our culture? God, where are you at in this government? God, where are you at? What are you, what are you doing? Well, he has a plan, and it is perfectly planned out. Do you see it? Or do you question just what I just did? See, we've been talking about God has a plan. He's in complete control. But church, do you trust him? Do do you trust him through this process? Do you trust him that he's got the whole world in his hands? And we can see this played out. And I know that kind of summed up a, a whole lot of chapters and a whole lot of weeks. I summed it up in just a few minutes. But God has a plan here at the end. Guess what happens at the end of this? After this battle of Armageddon? It's called the Myers Supper of the Lamb. We're going to have a great banquet in heaven, and it's going to be awesome. So awesome. God has a plan, and he's not forgotten about you. He's going to have a plan. If God has a banquet, it is going to be unlike any banquet that we've ever seen before. It is going to be unbelievable. So I started researching about banquets and big banquets and that they have and like money that has been spent on banquets and i found one i thought that might interest you and it 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 may not but there is a a, a famous music producer he's also uh, written music produced music uh, his name is sean combs uh, some people refer to him as puff daddy or p diddy and when he turned 40 he threw this great banquet each invitation each invitation was hand delivered with a gift inviting people to come to his birthday party for his 40th birthday party. All total, he spent $2 million for this birthday party. $2 million. He spent 300000 just in invitations and these small gifts. And if I remember, I think it was a bottle of wine that he, that he gave out. It was a black tie event. It was a big to-do, decorated All this food, expensive food, expensive drinks, all was inclusive. All they had to do was just come. And yet, God is going to outdo that. That's how awesome this is going to be. So God has a plan. But the question is, do you trust God right now through this? Can you trust God even when you don't see it? The church, this is the hard part. We kind of touched on this a little bit last week, the way that we ended, because we are to walk by faith not by sight we know this in church it's hard sometimes it's hard walking by faith look at the people through the bible we've got example after example of people who were walking by faith and not by sight john the baptist had one job one job and that was to prepare the way for jesus and here he was he was baptizing people asking him if he was the messiah he's like no no it's not me it's not me 
But there's coming somebody after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy to untie. I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. And then he sees him. He sees him coming. Coming towards him. And he stops dead in his track preaching. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And he baptized him. Could you imagine John the Baptist? No one. No one. He had one job to do. And I can imagine then, after he baptized Jesus, Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens opened up, the Spirit of God descended, and they heard like a voice that said, This is my beloved Son and who I'm well pleased. Could you imagine being John the Baptist going, I did it. I had one job and I got it right. But church, he struggled. He struggled. You know why? Because hardships came. Remember, we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. It wasn't in that. His glory and his self-sufficiency wasn't found even in baptizing of Jesus. It was just a short time later he found himself in prison in a dungeon awaiting death. He sent word to Jesus because he started questioning things. Have I done it? Have, have I really done it? Did I do it right? So he sent word to Jesus and he said, Are you him? Are you the one? Or should we look for another? And he didn't answer the question. But Jesus sent back word. He said, you tell John that the blind see, the lame walk. And he goes on to tell him a few other things. And so the people left to go back to tell John the Baptist. And then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, of all the prophets, none is greater than John the Baptist. And the church, I want you to hear me this. I want you to hear it good. John the Baptist never heard that compliment. He never heard it. The people had already left. He turned to the disciples and he said, none is greater than John the Baptist. Of all the prophets that's ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. You think about Elijah. He prayed down fire from heaven. None is greater than John the Baptist. You think about Elisha. He was dead in a tomb and somebody threw another dead body in there, touched his bone and that guy came to life just at touching the bones of Elisha. None is greater than John the Baptist. A whole city got saved when Jonah preached. And all he did, it was the shortest message in revival ever preached. See, if never, 40 days, you guys are going to be dead. Boom, a revival broke out. That was it. That's all he said. None is greater than John the Baptist. Look at all the things that all these people did. Abraham left everything he's ever known, walking by faith, the father of a nation. Of all these, none are greater than John the Baptist. And he never heard those words. Church, my point to you is, we don't always have that confirmation in our life. We don't always hear that, good job, you're doing it, way to go. It's hard. And sometimes we're kind of like John the Baptist, like, God, I don't see you at work here. Are, are you him or should we look for another? God, is this a church or, or should I look for another? God, is this a spouse or should I look for another? God, is this my kids really or should I look for some more? Don't get rid of your kids. <laughs> but sometimes as a parent, we question. We question. Church, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. My question to you is, as we're looking at this study of Revelation, and we're coming to a head, it's coming to a climax. We're going to talk about it next week, that this climax is coming. Can you trust God right now, even though you may not be able to see it? You may not be able to see the exact steps. But today, looking back to tomorrow, yeah, maybe we have a little bit better idea. When we can look back to next week, oh yeah, I can see it now. I couldn't see it then, but I see it now. When we're looking back to next year, when we get there and we look, God, <laughs> you did have a plan. God, you had it all under control. Here, I was worried. I was concerned. God, you had it all under control. Is there something in your life right now that is weighting you down, that's keeping you from walking by faith? We say we trust God all the time. Oh, the Lord is good. I trust Him. That's great. But when the rubber meets the road and your life gets challenged, your faith gets challenged, can you say, God, I stand with you. I trust you. I have no idea where we're going. I can't see the road, but I'm going to take every step walking by faith. You have a plan. We see it. And there's nothing that can be done to stop it. I trust you. I trust you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for all 
the clarity that you've given to us on Revelation. We're thankful, Father, that the church has been raptured out. And God, I pray right now, God, that you would grant us clarity, that we would move and respond, Father, in such a way right now that we would know exactly what it is that you would have us to do. Fill us up, God, right now. Holy Spirit, reveal yourself into us right now that we would respond to this precious word. God, you have a plan. There's times that we can see it, and Father, there's times in which we don't. Help us, Father, right now to trust in you, to allow you to lead us and to guide us, even if we may not be able to see it. God, that we'll allow you, allow you to lead us, even when we don't feel it. Even when we question. Father, speak to us right now. Church, as you continue to pray, if there's something heavy on your heart, then I encourage you to come this morning and lay that down at this altar. If there's something heavy on your heart, that's maybe, man, it's been, it's been eating at you. It's been hard because, man, it's been, been really challenging you about walking uh, by faith and not by sight, I, I encourage you to come to this altar and lay that down. The altar is open. If that's you today, your heart is heavy, I'm asking you to come and lay that down. Whatever that burden is, whatever that's keeping you, whatever it's hurting you, whatever it is that is just weighting you down, it's preventing you. It's affecting your walk with God. It's hurting your ability to walk by faith and not by sight. Would you come right now? This altar is open. Nobody's looking around. This is between you and God. If you feel that need, you feel that burden to come to the altar, then I'm encouraging you to come right now. If you feel that heaviness in your heart, you feel that weightiness, that, that's, not, that's not me, that, that's just the Holy Spirit drawing you to Him. No, would you come? If your heart is heavy, then I encourage you to come. There's some of you here this morning, maybe you don't feel led to come to the altar, but your heart is heavy. There's things on your heart there's situations on your heart maybe there's a situation right now in which you've been challenged with it's challenging your faith it's challenging your family and it's really eating at you about trusting God through this process now we have the opportunity to pray for you if that's you today I'm going to ask you if you would just to raise your hand up whatever it is and there's hands going up everywhere yes wow there's be others hey I just need you to pray for us thank you be more yeah there'll be more yeah let's pray Churches pray, God, you see these situations. These hands represent a real life situation in which we need guidance for, Father. Clarity. That we can make not only the right decision, but the best decision. And God, through this, we've been challenged that we could trust you to the end. Nothing's going to be able to stop your plan. And you've got it. And God, you're not on the edge of your seat ruling, but I believe that you're sitting back in complete and total authority and control. And we pray right now, Father, for each and every one of these situations. God, that you may move in a mighty way. God, that these lives would be touched. And God, that it would be a powerful end result. Not of who we are, but just that we're trusting in the one who can do something about it. Father, you are so good to us. Now help us, Father. Help us, Father, through these situations in which we face. Father, I pray for every family here. God, that you'd bind them close together. God, I pray for every marriage. Father, that you'd strengthen them. And I know Satan wants nothing more than to throw a wedge in any way he possibly can. May you help them, Father, to bind them close together that nothing, no form of Satan can penetrate them. Father, I pray for every student here. God, that you'd help them as they go to school. God, not only that they'd be a beacon of light for you, God, that they'd be able to stand bold, proclaiming that they are a Christian, proclaiming that they are a child of God. And help us, Father, as a church, that we'd be not only on fire for you, but that it would be contagious, Father, that it would spread, that we would show your goodness, your love, your mercy into all areas of our life, whether it be at work or at the grocery store. Help us, Father, to show others that you are in complete control. Thank you, Father, for your word and the study and revelation. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment? You've got some praise.